Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Welcome to Dark Poutine. My name is Michael Mike Brown. and across, Michael Mike? <laughs> yes. Across the table from me is Matthew Matt Stockton, which you hate, Matt. Hi, everybody. Like doormat. Well, there's only one T, so it literally becomes like doormat. You're, no, you're nobody's doormat, <laughs> oh, no. Matthew. <laughs> the views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor its parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque. Grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. You are responsible for obtaining and maintaining at your own cost all equipment needed to listen to dark poutine. Dark poutine can be addictive. Side effects may include, but not be limited to, pausing and questioning the system, elevated heart rate, pondering humanity, odd looks from colleagues as you laugh out loud at work, family members not into true crime worrying about you. Positive side effects may include some perspectives and opinions that you disagree with, as well as some wokeness and empathy. If you don't think dark poutine is for you, consult your doctor immediately. On the 8th of December 1980, the world was rocked by the murder of influential rock and roll icon, artist, sometimes controversial activist and dad, John Lennon, in New York City. After an evening recording session at the record plant, John Lennon and his wife, artist Yoko Ono, returned to their Central Park West apartment building, the Dakota. As John and Yoko approached the entrance of the building, they passed a man for whom only hours earlier John had signed an autograph. The man, Mark David Chapman, 25, watched the couple walk by and then pulled a 38 Special from his coat and unloaded upon John Lennon, shooting him in the back four times. The deadly hollow point bullets tore through the former Beatle, mortally wounding him. He was pronounced dead at Roosevelt Hospital some time later. When police arrived, they found Chapman patiently reading his book, Catcher in the Rye. This is Dark Poutine episode 248, Away Game, The Murder of John Lennon. I find this one, I was so excited to see that we're going to do this episode. Mm -hmm. uh, Lennon and his murder, which many people call an assassination, is so engaging on so many levels of around politics and spirituality and how we as a society create like archetypes and myths uh, about uh, our stars, our, yeah. our celebrities. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, Yeah, and that's kind of, well, one of the reasons why I'm so attracted to that story as well, so... Plus, I was a big fan of John Lennon, and yeah. I get into why that is later on. Anyway, those who know me well know my enduring love and obsession with the Beatles and with John Lennon, his music, and his art. John Lennon was more than a famous musician. He was a three-dimensional, complex human being whose influence on popular music and art still resonates more than 40 years after his tragic death. John Winston Lennon was born in Liverpool, England on the 9th of October in 1940. His parents, Julia and Alfred, named him after his paternal grandfather, John Jack Lennon, and wartime Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Alfred, a merchant seaman, was away at sea when his son was born, and John's relationship with him would be intermittent and distant until Alfred died in 1976. The marriage between Julia and Alfred was strained too. And after they broke up, neither could adequately care for the boy financially or emotionally. They agreed to leave the youngster in the more stable care of Julia's sister Mimi, 
and her husband, George, a dairyman who lived at Mendips, 251 Menlove Avenue in Woolton. Menlove Ave in Mendips. Sounds like my kind of place, Mike. <laughs> oh, dear. I didn't even think about that when I was writing it. I live at number 69 Menlove. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> you started it. No, I didn't. Mimi Smith was a fierce protector of young John Lennon. Some, including Paul McCartney, later said she was extremely strict with him, but her motives were good. Mimi later said, quote, I had to be solid because I had a boy to bring up. It was my job to be there. He never came into an empty house. What he could not make out was how I knew when he was up to something. She continued, He was inventive and always a leader. Every time he sat down, he never wasted a minute, and it was always either drawing or writing poetry or reading. He was a great reader, and he sang himself to sleep every night." End quote. From JohnLennon.com, quote, Lennon loved children's poems, fairy tales, mother goose rhymes, and the zany nonsense literature of such writers as Edward Lear and Lewis Carroll. He read them voraciously as a child and retained his fondness for them into adulthood. They are primary sources for the pun-wielding, wild and whirling words of his two splendid books of stories and drawings in his own right, 1964, and A Spaniard in the Works, 1965, end quote. His later song lyrics are rife with playful references to these fairy tales and fantastical images of his childhood. The one-day Beatles' interest in music developed early, too. Uncle George gave John a harmonica, which he learned to play. His mother, Julia, visited often, but in his teen years, he began to see her more regularly and tried to reestablish a relationship with her, it was Julia who introduced John to Elvis Presley's music and taught him how to play Ain't That a Shame by Fats Domino on the banjo. He eventually progressed to the guitar and bought a Galatone Champion Acoustic for which Julia lent him five pounds and ten shillings. John's understanding of life and art showed early. He said, quote, When I was five years old, my mother always told me that happiness was the key to life. When I went to school, they asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. I wrote down happy. They told me I didn't understand the assignment, and I told them they didn't understand life." End quote. John was a rebel, a dreamer, and a class clown with an admitted chip on his shoulder which he'd struggled with most of his life. He wanted to become a musician, but practical Mimi wasn't sure that was a viable career choice. John was later quoted as saying, quote, My auntie who brought me up all my life, all the time she was saying, the guitar is all right as a hobby, John, but you'll never make a living at it. So I got that on a plaque for her and sent it to her in the house that I bought her. End quote. Tragedy struck in the summer of 1958 when John Lennon's mother died after visiting his Aunt Mimi. From Beatlesbible.com. On July 15, 1958, when John was 17, Julia died on Menlove Avenue shortly after leaving Mimi's house while crossing the road to get to a bus stop. She was struck by a standard Vanguard car driven by an off-duty policeman, 24-year-old Eric Clegg. Contrary to some reports, Clegg was not drunk at the time. He was driving under the 30 miles per hour speed limit. He was, however, a learner driver who was unaccompanied. Julia's husband, John Dykins, traveled to Sefton General Hospital by taxi, accompanied by John Lennon, who refused to take a final look at his mother. Dykins himself later died in a car crash in December of 1965. At an inquest held later, Eric Clegg was acquitted of all charges. He never tried to contact Lennon's family in the aftermath of the accident. Julia's death deeply traumatized John, who would later refer to her in the songs Julia, Mother, and My Mummy's Dead. His first son, Julian, was named after her." End quote. After he had his guitar at 15, John Lennon founded his first group, the Quarrymen, a skiffle group named after Quarry Bank High School where the youthful musicians went to class. At the band's second backyard gig, John met another boy he'd be inextricably linked to for the rest of his life, Paul McCartney. After learning of Paul's like-minded love of popular music of the day, John asked Paul to join the band. George Harrison, a younger boy but a talented guitarist, came through Paul. Over the next few years, the group went through name and personnel changes, eventually settling on The Beatles in 1960. The group's drummer Pete Best was ultimately ousted, some say because he was better looking than Paul, and in came Ringo Starr. 
They honed their musical chops in local bars and clubs, but they point to their time in Hamburg, Germany as the most formative. There, to sometimes rough and rowdy crowds, the lads played hours-long shows fueled by crates of cheap beer and a stimulant John was introduced to called predulin or phenmetrazine. They knew they had something special, but sometimes doubted themselves. In their dressing room before a gig to pump themselves up, John would yell, Where are we going, fellas? To which his bandmate would yell, To the toppermost of the poppermost, Johnny. And that's precisely where they went. Much has been written about what happened after the release of their first album, Please Please Me, in 1962. We won't bore you with the ground that's already been well covered, but suffice it to say, in a relentless whirlwind career spanning the next seven years, the Beatles became the biggest band on the planet. Their success was not without its controversies, including links to drug use, especially LSD and marijuana. However, it was a reaction to one offhand comment that John had made to a reporter that shook the band. During a 1966 interview for the London Evening Standard, John said some things that American religious folks at the time found unacceptable. Quote, We're more popular than Jesus now, Lennon told rock journalist Maureen Cleave. I don't know which will go first, rock and roll or Christianity. End quote. The more secular Brits barely noticed the quip or more likely understood what John was driving at. But a firestorm erupted when the comments were reprinted months later in an American teen magazine in what was then a form of cancel culture. There were record-burning parties at which people called the Beatles' music satanic. So, listen to this. Okay. Picture it. Yep. Around... Uh, Picture it. Picture... S- Sicily, 1942. In this case, it was Strathroy, 1979. 1979, Ish. okay. Yeah, Around okay. this time, right? So. Yep. Uh, you know the song My Sweet Lord by George Harrison? I do, and I love it. I yep. love that song so much. And he was sued for that, uh, Yeah, the chorus, because it sounded like... Uh, Somebody else's. Yeah, exactly. So I'm going to this Bethel Baptist church. Why were you going to a Bethel Baptist church, Because my friend across the street went, and it was something to do on Sunday mornings. Okay, there you go. So Fair it was like in the basement, like the youth group thingy while the parents were upstairs. Sure, Sunday school. So the last day I went, and you'll understand why it was the last day, even back then, I was mm-hmm. nine or ten years old, something like that. Yeah. I could read bullshit, right? Sure. So they played the beginning of that song where they say, hallelujah, right? Yes. And then they, and they said the Beatles are Christians until they went, literally, Mike, this is what they did. Beatles were Christians until they went to India and they became Satanists. And then they played like this last half of the song, Hera Christian, and said they switched the words. But I knew that song and I knew that song was always like both were in it. Yeah. And... You know, because it, it's Hare Krishna. It has like a Vedic prayer in there, right? Nothing, sure, nothing yeah. to do with Satanism. And they played the Village People YMCA. And said, well, that's a great song. I love the YMCA. They said it was about p- pedophilia. Hang out with all the boys. So YMCA, hang out with all the boys, pedophilia. So this whole groomer nonsense that people have been on about, like banging on about for in yeah. the news, yeah. has been going on since, <laughs> probably since... <laughs> Since Christ was a cowboy. So this was my experience with church. Um, and I never went back after oh this because, because I like My Sweet Lord by George Harrison so much. Yeah, I love that yeah. song. It's yeah. a great song. And and you do you like YMCA by The Village People? Of course I do. I wonder, why is that, Matthew? Because it's fun. And you like to hang out with all the boys. It's fun. <laughs> YMCA. Exactly. Y- everyone can't see me. I'm doing like the little movement there. Yeah. They can hear you sing badly, though. <laughs> Just because you can't sing it doesn't mean you shouldn't. (laughs) Oh, dear. I was thinking the opposite. After John's comments blew up, press conferences were cancelled as the band and their management went into damage control mode. They even considered cancelling what would be the group's final North American tour. To mitigate the damage, John was trotted out in front of the press to explain himself. Quote, I'm not anti-Christ or anti-religion or anti-God, Lennon clarified. I'm not saying we're better or greater or comparing us with Jesus Christ as a person or God as a thing or whatever it is. I just said what I said and was wrong or was taken wrong, and now it's all this. Unable to restrain himself, John tossed in, If I had said television was more popular than Jesus, I might have gotten away with it. When he was asked if he would like to apologize formally, Lennon replied, If you want me to apologize, if that will make you happy, then okay. 
I'm sorry, end quote. The press conference, which was televised and shown worldwide, appeared to temper the controversy, even though it didn't soothe the Beatles' nerves about touring. Despite Lennon's apology, the Memphis City Council sought to cancel both Beatles shows, but the bid failed. Instead, the Ku Klux Klan protested outside the show. So I have a lot of Christian friends, as do you, Mike. Sure. You know, people who don't weaponize Jesus. No. Right? And, yeah. And, and these people like the Klan, they're about as Christian as suicide bombers are Muslim, which is not at all. Right. Right? I actually think Jesus was a cool dude and probably would have actually listened to the Beatles. I, I think you're probably correct. Right? Yeah. Because they, they had good messages. They sure. Did. Yeah. Yeah. To the disappointment of millions of Beatles fans, they played their final live concert in San Francisco, California, at Candlestick Park on the 29th of August, 1966. Among other things, including the insanity and stress of the controversy mentioned above, they decided they'd never again play in public. One last time, however, they made an unannounced live appearance in January 1969 on the rooftop of the Apple Building while recording their Let It Be album. At age 21, John had married the supportive, traditional Cynthia Powell, whom he divorced in 1968, leaving her custody of their son Julian, for which Paul McCartney penned the number one hit, Hey Jude. John was already involved with Yoko Ono at the time. They met at a London art show of Yoko's and had hit it off immediately. John and Yoko became inseparable, and that in part, especially with Yoko's now ubiquitous presence, even in the recording studio, began to grate on the band. There were other issues too, as they fell into heroin use together, eventually leading to John's addiction to the drug. John began to record music and make art with Yoko. There was Unfinished Music No. 1, Two Virgins, known more for its cover featuring full frontal nudity of the people than for its music. And they also released Unfinished Music No. 2, Life with Lions, and Wedding Album. John was 28 when he married the independent unconventional Yoko Ono in March of 1969. I think a lot of people um, don't understand that Yoko Ono was, picture it, Mike, she's a Japanese woman in 1950s America. Like she moved from Tokyo with her parents. Mm -hmm. uh, and she was actually part of um, an art movement called Fluxes. Don't, don't let me get into the details of it. Well, people should know like a little bit about what Fluxus is. Yeah, so it's essentially, Fluxus was about the, it was kind of like, it's the approach to making the art more than the art itself. And okay. It, and it was really experimental. So you had like, so she was working with... It was avant-garde. Yeah, she was working with the likes of John Cage and Terry Riley and George Brecht before she met Lennon. Yeah, so and, she was an established artist before she met yeah, John Lennon. Yeah, and like she, she didn't become Yoko Ono because of him. Right. Right, and yeah. uh, you know, she's 89 now and she she's... She's still going. Yeah. And she follows me on Twitter. Wow. <laughs> yeah, which is like, uh, I followed her and I followed the Beatles. They both have followed me back. Oh, that's excellent. I guess it's because I always, I've tweeted about them and stuff, maybe positively. you're a super fan. Well, yeah, I kind of am. But anyway. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think, I mean, Yoko, I have problems with her <laughs> too, that, you know, but it's not, I don't have, like, she wasn't really riding coattails i don't think no and we've all done the joke she broke up the band because it became a cultural thing but she didn't and even even paul mccartney said of course she didn't yeah you know if you look at that it was probably the drugs that broke up the band well if you watch uh the disney plus documentary called get back which is about the making of let it be right you can see george was unhappy yeah. Uh, for quite some time, he he was really unhappy and actually left the band during the making of that for a time. And John would show up late and clearly out of his mind yeah. stoned. That's too so bad. so that makes working as artists together very difficult. Well, it me, it, I've worked with people that were coming in screwed up all the time. It doesn't make for good work at all. I have come uh, into work screwed up. Artists are not artists. It, yeah. it doesn't make for productivity. Right? Exactly. The couple had connections to Canada as well. John Lennon became an outspoken anti-war activist. In June of 1969, in room 1742 at the Queen Elizabeth Hotel in Montreal, John and Yoko held a bed-in to protest the war in Vietnam and war in general. There they stayed in bed, being visited by various celebrities and reporters, which culminated in the recording of the song Give Peace a Chance. Present in the hotel room for the recording were some interesting characters, including 
Tommy Smothers, accompanying John on guitar, author Allen Ginsberg, LSD guru Timothy Leary, actor Dick Gregory, and singer Petula Clark. John was headed in a different direction, and the Beatles' demise was imminent. The final time the four members recorded together was the session for Abbey Road's closing track, The End, on the 18th of August, 1969. The song's lyrics end with a prophetic phrase, and in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. The Beatles split in September 1969, but the breakup was not made public until April of 1970. In their seven-year career, every album was near the top of the charts, and they amassed no fewer than 20 number one hit songs. John and Yoko formed the Plastic Ono Band and released Live Peace in Toronto in 1969. The band's lineup was fluid, including several rock and roll luminaries like Eric Clapton on lead guitar, Billy Preston on keyboards, John's old friend Klaus Vormann on bass, and even George Harrison and Ringo Starr made appearances, but never Paul McCartney. The relationship between John and Paul was strained for the remainder of John's life. Another visit to Canada came on December 23, 1969, when John and Yoko brought their peace campaign to Ottawa. There they met father of our sitting Prime Minister, then PM, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, from Beatlesbible.com. The meeting took place in the center block on Parliament Hill in Ottawa. Lennon and Ono had arrived in the city at 2 a.m. in the morning, having traveled from Toronto via Montreal. They arrived at the Parliament building at 11 a.m. with a scrum of photographers ready to snap the moment they met the Canadian PM. It was the only time Lennon and Ono were able to take their peace campaign directly to a world leader. The meeting lasted for 51 minutes behind closed doors, although news cameras were on hand before and after. When they emerged, a reporter asked Lennon and Ono what had taken them so long. Ono replied that it was because they all had been enjoying the conversation. Lennon added, quote, We spent about 50 minutes together, which was longer than he had spent with any head of state. There would be world peace if all politicians were like Mr. Trudeau. The couple also met with Health Minister John Monroe for almost two hours before flying back to Toronto and from there to London later that day. End quote. Although always a preacher of peace, there were times that John's temper got him into trouble over the years. John later said, I fought men, I hit women. That is why I am always on about peace, you see. It is the most violent people who go for love and peace. Everything's the opposite, but I sincerely believe in love and peace. I am a violent man who has learned not to be violent and regrets his violence. End quote. After the success of his album Imagine in 1971, John and Yoko moved to New York, and John immediately embraced U.S. radical left politics. The U.S. president, Richard Nixon, hated John and his politics, and Nixon saw John's power to sway the people as dangerous. The government set about trying to deport John Lennon, but ultimately failed. John was embroiled in a continuing legal battle with U.S. immigration authorities and was denied permanent residency in the U.S., and the issue wouldn't be resolved until 1976, so they spent five years fighting just to become a permanent resident of the U.S. And who did more damage, Lennon or Tricky Dick? Well, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, maybe... Uh, well, Lennon did sing about Tricky Dicky in one of his songs on the Imagine album. Did so, he? Oh, yes, he did. There were cracks in John's marriage to Yoko Ono as well. Beginning in the summer of 1973 and lasting through early 1975, John and Yoko were separated. John relocated to Los Angeles where he became a hard-drinking rock club night owl while carrying on an affair with 22-year-old May Pang, a friend of Yoko's. John drank fought and spiraled into substance abuse, eventually coming out the other side, ready to go home to Yoko. John and Yoko's second son, Sean Ono Lennon, was born on the 9th of October, 1975, John Lennon's 35th birthday. John took on the role of house husband. Lennon began a five-year hiatus from the music industry, during which time he later said he, quote, baked bread and looked after the baby. But in 1980, John had the itch to make music again, and returned to the recording studio with Yoko. They recorded their album, Double Fantasy. In October, they released the single, Just Like Starting Over, and it went straight up the charts. In November, they released the album, which was gobbled up by John Lennon fans who'd missed the Beatles' music. He'd had the bug again, and began writing and recording his next album, Milk and Honey. 
John spoke of the struggles with his ego in a Playboy interview in 1980. Quote, Part of me suspects that I'm a loser and the other part of me thinks I'm God Almighty. John Lennon also had premonitions leading up to his demise that he was due for a rendezvous of some kind. From the book, Let Me Take You Down by Jack Jones. Quote, John said he dreamt of getting shot. He had nightmares of violent death. Weird recurring dreams, as he put it, about dying, about getting shot. He talked about getting shot as a modern form of crucifixion. The best way of moving on to the next life with a clean karmic slate. End quote. There was one fan who was watching John's return to public life carefully and began plotting to do something awful. His name was Mark David Chapman. More after a quick break. And we are back, Matthew. I know you have a lot of thoughts around this <laughs> particular episode that you want to get into. And a lot of it is about like philosophical iconography and, and all that kind of stuff. So try, let's try and go down this path together. You know, thinking about celebrities who die before their time. So as you were reading this, I was thinking about all these celebrities that died before their time and how they become some sort of archetype in our imaginations. So you have like Marilyn Monroe, right? She's the lover. Mm -hmm. And you had um, James Dean, who is the rebel. Okay. And Elvis Presley, the, the ruler or the king. Right? Sure, yeah. And then Lenin, I think, sort of became the innocent, you know, the, the dreamer, the idealist. Sure. And we like to have, we like to like put them into these boxes so they're forever this one thing, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think that some celebrities understand this and either consciously or subconsciously support it even when they're alive. Yeah. Like this quote that you had earlier in the show um, from mm -hmm. John Lennon when he was five, right? Yeah. First, he's five, so how, is, how can he really remember exactly? Well, I don't what he know. Said? Some sometimes you remember. Maybe it's apocryphal. Maybe it is uh, hyperbole a little bit. Yeah. But that that hyperbole is there to tell a story, right, and create right. an image, right? Yep. And so notice, I'll, I'll I'll say the quote again, but notice how he uses the word "they." So it's crafted in a way so it, it's like the innocence against they, those in power. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say my teacher or Mrs. Smith, right? right? So when I was five years old, my mother always told me that happiness was the key to life. When I went to school, they asked me if I wanted what I wanted to be when I grew up. I wrote down happy. They told me I didn't understand the assignment. I told them they didn't understand life. Yeah. So it creates this, in even the story, he's an innocent, he's a child, right? Mm -hmm. And this perpetuates that sort of myth about John Lennon. Sure. And then in death, you know, I think... The archetype is further supported by all of us, right? Yep. So you, you're reading this book from Jack Jones, um, where he, he, he was talking about the dreams of getting shot. Right. Right. And then in death, that archetype is further supported by all of us in, in some ways. So the, the quote you read from Jack Jones, where he was talking about um, John having dreams about getting shot. Right? Yeah. And then he pulls that further and alludes to crucifixion. Right, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we all know the other archetypal innocent that was crucified. Yeah, we we don't want to get into that because John got into trouble talking about that, yeah. that yeah. person early. But, but all of this is, it all swirls around, right, and creates this image of John Lennon. Mm -hmm. um, and it all works, doesn't it? So Marilyn Monroe, the lover, dies in bed alone from an overdose, you know? Yeah, she died... Seven years to the day that I was born. So I am, I am Marilyn Monroe reincarnated. I am her seven year itch. You're the seven year itch. Yes. <laughs> and then, um, James Dean. James Dean. I almost said Johnny Depp, who's another <laughs> rebel, right? James Dean, like, dies in a sports car going fast. The rebel. Mm -hmm. Elvis Presley, the ruler, the king, dies on his throne. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> the throne. <laughs> And Lenin, the innocent, is murdered. And, yeah. we, and we often call it an assassination, which is like a crucifixion in a way. Yeah, right? he was, yeah, it was an assassination, yeah. really. And it's, and, and we love these archetypes because they help us tell stories. Mm -hmm. And Lenin was this fantastic artist that I think would have done so much more really great stuff. Yeah. 
Um, but then again, maybe he would have gone off the rails. Yep. Maybe he would have been canceled by some movement or another, right? He was only human. Yep. But we've created these archetypes of, and they're forever in our minds. Yeah. He's the innocent, the dreamer, Marilyn Monroe's the lover, James Dean's the rebel. Yeah. Right. It's, it's fascinating, but the horrible way he died, you know, made him this innocent, almost this almost Christ-like figure. Yeah. It's right? fascinating that it was sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy for him. This, yeah. this whole thing. And I mean, I'm not saying he caused it, no, but, but it's, it's really fascinating uh, yeah. to, to, to dig into it in this way. I, and I'm not, this is why I love these stories. Um, and it's interesting how the sixties were an era full of this kind of thing. Yeah. You know, uh, all these people dying young, mm. you know, Jimi Hendrix, Jim Morrison, Janis Joplin. Yeah. I think in 30 years, we'll look back at like the, 80s, 90s, 2000s as well. Well, we have Kurt Cobain in the yeah, 90s. But yeah. but yeah, so yeah, it's fun to sort of ponder these things. Yeah. Good, good stuff. Yeah. Mark David Chapman was born on May 10th, 1955 in Fort Worth, Texas to Father David Chapman, a staff sergeant in the U.S. Air Force, and his mother, Diane, a nurse. The Chapman family moved around a lot but he spent his teen years in Decatur, Georgia, where he attended Columbia High School. Mark later said that his father was cruel and violent, ruling their home with verbal and physical intimidation. To cope, Mark Chapman retreated to his mind. There he created a world in which he could rule as God, creating an entire community of little people he said lived in his bedroom walls. It was, he said, the Beatles who'd inspired that escape, and he was enamored with the band. From the book, Let Me Take You Down by author Jack Jones. Quote, Little people, he sang, changing the words of the Lennon-McCartney tune, Little Child. Little people, won't you play with me? Little people, you must stay with me. End quote. Mark's school experience was not great either. As with many children of military families, he was the perpetual new kid in town. As he was a bit overweight and not athletic like the cool kids of his age, he became a target of the school's bullies. Mark found another escape at 14 when he began to drink and do drugs every chance he got. At one point, he ran away from home to Atlanta where he lived on the streets for a couple of weeks. He saw himself as Mark the Freak. He knew he was in trouble and began to look for a way out. And while still in high school, Chapman became a born-again Christian. His newfound faith did help for a while, but he soon found himself living two lives. With his Christian friends, he played guitar in a Christian rock band and worked as a YMCA youth camp counselor. He was popular with the kids he led at camp, who nicknamed him Captain Nemo, a reference to the enigmatic submarine captain from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. But with his drug buddies, he was drinking excessively and doing lots of different mind-expanding chemicals. Often, he listened to the Beatles' psychedelic music while tripping. The Beatles' music had grown with him. He felt an intrinsic connection with the band. From Let Me Take You Down by author Jack Jones. Quote, they were no longer the Beatles whose music I had played for my little people, Chapman says. The Beatles by then were into long hair, beards, meditation, and drugs. The Beatles were into things that fit my life perfectly. End quote. Mark was obsessed with everything the Beatles did together and as solo artists. He followed their every move in the news and consumed their music. He was particularly obsessed with John Lennon. Inspired by LSD guru Timothy Leary's interpretation of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, John was telling everyone to turn off your mind, relax, and float downstream. Chapman had suffered several bad trips on LSD, which he'd seen horrendous things while hallucinating. His faith had come to him during one of these acid trips in 1971. From Let Me Take You Down by author Jack Jones, quote, Describing the spiritual encounter with a psychiatrist, the late Dr. Bernard Diamond, at Rikers Island in April 1981, Chapman said that God, quote, actually came into the room, but I couldn't see him, but he was there. He was right here on my left knee, and I felt tingling from the tip of the toe to the top of my head, and I felt like I had finally found the answer, you know, what I had been searching for through the drugs and, you know, the whole hippie scene type of thing, end quote. Mark turned his back on the Beatles, perhaps blaming them for leading him astray. From Let Me Take You Down, quote, After Chapman's spiritual conversion, a friend said, I remember that Mark said the Lennon song Imagine was a communist song, and that comment about the Beatles being more popular than Jesus, that really pissed him off. 
Other friends, members of church groups that Chapman joined after his instant spiritual conversion, recall that he engaged in a vendetta against Imagine, warning that Lenin's message to imagine a world with no heaven or religion was blasphemy. At prayer meetings and religious rallies he attended, often several times a week, friends remember that he would sing his own foreboding lyrics to Lenin's tune, quote, Imagine John Lennon is dead, end quote. Mark Chapman's obsession with J.D. Salinger's Catcher in the Rye also began around this time. According to Britannica.com, the novel details two days in the life of 16-year-old Holden Caulfield after he has been expelled from prep school. Confused and disillusioned, Holden searches for truth and rails against the phoniness of the adult world. He ends up exhausted and emotionally unstable. The events are related after the fact, end quote. Chapman identified with the book's protagonist, Holden Caulfield, and the biggest phony in his mind was John Lennon. Do you think this book is... I've never read the book, Mike. I don't understand why. I, I, I just, never, I just okay. never got around to it. So, yep. and, and I kind of like wonder, is the book overrated? And, and would it have had such longevity if it was involved in this case? It, well, I was drawn to read it because of the case. Right. So I've reread the book a couple of times, and I related to it in a big way when I was 19 because I was closer to the protagonist's age. Mm -hmm. And now when I read it, I think, wow, what an asshole Holden is. You know, like, right. he, he was so naive and he didn't have the life experience to understand what was going on. Right. So that's what this book is about. It's about the perspective of a young person yeah, it might be worth reading, but it probably would have been better had you read it when you were younger. Right. Or before I knew it was related to this case. Yeah, exactly. Right? Because now it's loaded. Now, with, now I'm watching for it, right? Right. It's yeah. loaded with all this stuff. And it was even, uh, I do believe, related to uh, the assassination of Ronald Reagan as well. Yeah. So, you know, whatever. Assassination attempt. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, the assassination attempt of Ronald, well, you know, Ronald Reagan wasn't real that he actually died during that attempt and that was a crisis actor who was playing <laughs> ronald reagan after that oh don't get people started <laughs> somebody's gonna believe that who cares <laughs> yeah there's this thing called humor that used to exist yeah <laughs> and sarcasm and all those kind of things and that seems to have gone the way of the dodo bird it's okay we don't uh, the podcast isn't for the village idiot yeah Mark David Chapman told author Jack Jones about his growing hatred for John Lennon. Quote, I would listen to his music and I would get angry at him for saying in the song God that he didn't believe in God, that he just believed in him and Yoko, and that he didn't believe in the Beatles. This was another thing that angered me, even though this record had been done at least 10 years previously. I just wanted to scream out loud, who does he think he is saying these things about God and heaven and the Beatles? Saying that he doesn't believe in Jesus and things like that, at that point, my mind was going through a total blackness of anger and rage. So I brought the Lennon book home into this catcher in the rye milieu where my mindset is holding Caulfield and antiphoniness. So he sort of um, thought of Lennon as this Christ-like figure, and now that he's now he's a false prophet, he sort of moved from one point to another in his head, right? In this weird world of yeah of his mind. Mark reconnected with an old school friend, Jessica Blankenship, who became his first girlfriend. Mark followed Jessica to Covenant College, an evangelical Presbyterian liberal arts college in Lookout Mountain, Georgia. After only one semester, Mark was struggling at school and dropped out, having been racked with guilt over a drunken affair he'd had with another girl. Mark and Jessica broke up, and Mark returned to work as a camp counselor. It was the only job he'd ever felt any real success in, but after an argument with his supervisor, he quit. Mark was depressed. In the hope that a change of scenery might improve his mood, in 1977, Mark Chapman moved to Hawaii. As we've said a few times before, the geographical cure rarely works because wherever you go, there you are. Mark attempted to die by suicide using a hose from the exhaust to the inside of his car. He passed out during the attempt, but woke up to find that the plastic hose he'd used had melted, thus saving his life. After a stint in the psych ward, Mark went to work as a janitor in the hospital for a time. But once again, his attitude got him into trouble, and he was fired. 
He then worked as a security guard, working nights and drinking himself to sleep during the day. Mark's world was again shaken when his parents divorced. After she left Mark's father, his mom came to Hawaii to be closer to her troubled son. Inspired by the book Around the World in 80 Days, Chapman decided a trip around the world would help him shake the dust of depression off his boots. He visited Tokyo, Seoul, Hong Kong, Singapore, Bangkok, New Delhi, Beirut, Geneva, London, Paris, and Dublin. He began a relationship with his travel agent, a Japanese-American woman named Gloria Abe, whom he married on June 2, 1979. It isn't lost on Lennon fans that Chapman's girlfriend was of Japanese heritage, just like John's wife Yoko. Some believe that Chapman was secretly envious of John and wanted so badly to become him that he emulated the rock star's life. Court TV's Crime Library article wrote a decent timeline about what happened leading up to Lennon's murder. On September 20th, Mark David Chapman wrote a letter to a friend, Linda Irish, in New Mexico. On it, he drew a picture of Diamond Head with the sun, moon, and stars above it. I'm going nuts, he wrote. He signed it, The Catcher in the Rye. Mark Chapman took notice when John returned to the limelight in 1980. On October 20th, Chapman read in the Honolulu Star Bulletin about John Lennon's return to recording after a five-year hiatus. Lennon and his wife, the artist Yoko Ono, had cut an album called Double Fantasy. The fact that Lennon was back in the news and at the top of the charts with ease after a five-year absence angered Mark Chapman. He began to obsess about killing the ex-Beatle, who he saw as his spiritual nemesis. On October 23rd, Chapman quit his security job and signed out for the last time. Instead of the usual chappy, he wrote John Lennon, then he crossed it out. He began planning his trip to New York, where he intended to kill John Lennon. Chapman later admitted that John was not the only target he'd had in mind, but Lennon was at the top of the list. Other potential targets included Paul McCartney, talk show host Johnny Carson, actress Elizabeth Taylor, actor George C. Scott, former First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, recently elected U.S. President Ronald Reagan, Hawaii Governor George Arioshi, and David Bowie. On October 27th, Chapman went to a Honolulu gun store and for $169 bought a five-shot, short-barrel, 38 caliber Charter Arms Special. Ironically, the salesman was named Ono. The irony was not lost on Mark. On October 30th, wearing a new suit and top coat, the revolver in his suitcase, Mark Chapman boarded a plane for New York, intending to kill John Lennon. But he'd been dissuaded after seeing the film Ordinary People. It isn't clear what was in the movie that moved him, but he returned to Hawaii immediately, believing everything was going to be okay. It didn't take long before the obsession to kill John Lennon returned and Chapman began planning a second trip to New York, intent on following through with his original plan of murder. Chapman arrived in New York for the second time on December 6 and checked into a YMCA where he paid $16.50 per night for a room. He bought himself a brand spanking new copy of the album Double Fantasy, pocketed his 38 and his copy of Catcher in the Rye and headed to the Dakota where he hung out for the next two days returning to the Y to sleep at night hoping to see and kill John Lennon. The Dakota, also known as the Dakota Apartments, is a cooperative apartment building at 1 West 72nd Street on the Upper West Side of Manhattan in New York City. The Dakota was constructed between 1880 and 1884 in the Renaissance Revival style and was designed by Henry Janeway Hardenberg for businessman Edward Cabot Clark. The building was one of the first significant developments on the Upper West Side and is the oldest remaining luxury apartment building in New York City. The building is a National Historic Landmark and has been designated a City Landmark by the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission. The Dakota has historically been home to many artists, actors, and musicians, including John Lennon, of course, and it was used as the location for the Roman Polanski horror film, Rosemary's Baby, starring Mia Farrow, who lived just across the street. On the afternoon of December 8, 1980, Mark David Chapman's dream of meeting John Lennon came true. Mark Chapman stuck out the double fantasy album and a pen, asking John to sign it for him from Court TV's Crime Library feature on John Lennon's murder. Quote, On the Mugshots show, Chapman's recorded voice tells the story. He is describing an event that happened ten years before, but there is still awe in his voice. He said, sure, and wrote his name. And when he handed it back to me, he looked at me and kind of nodded his head. Is that all you want? 
like, just like that, like an inquiry into a different matter. I said, yeah. And I said, thanks, John. And he again said, is that all you want? And there was Yoko. She was already in the car, the limo. The door was open and it was running. It was out in the middle of the street. And he asked me twice and I said, yeah, thanks, that's all. Or something like that. He got into the car and drove away. I was just overwhelmed by his sincerity. I had expected a brush off, but it was just the opposite. I was on cloud nine. And there was a little bit of me going, why didn't you shoot him? And I said, I can't shoot him like this. I wanted to get the autograph. And for the first time in a while, he prayed to God for the grace just to take his record and go home. End quote. That's not what happened. Mark David Chapman was compelled to wait for John Lennon's return. At 10.50, a white limo pulled up to the curb and John and Yoko exited the limo and walked toward the building where Mark David Chapman still waited. A few other fans were there, too, as well as the doormen. In a statement recorded by police hours later, Chapman declared, He walked past me, and then a voice in my head said, Do it, do it, do it, over and over again, saying, Do it, do it, do it, do it, like that. John and Yoko passed Chapman, who then pulled out his pistol, adopted a combat stance, holding the gun in both hands and pointing it at John Lennon. He called out, Mr. Lennon. In his confession to police, Chapman said, I pulled the gun out of my pocket. I handed it over to my left hand. I don't remember aiming. I must have done it, but I don't remember drawing the bead or whatever you call it. I just pulled the trigger steady five times. End quote. Seeing he was in danger, John turned to run, but four of the five shots ripped into his back, mortally wounding him. John ran six steps to the building where he collapsed face down saying, I'm shot. Chapman just stood there, gun in hand, the building's doorman ran over and took Chapman's gun and kicked it away. From Court TV's crime library, quote, Chapman took off his hat and coat and threw them on the sidewalk. He knew the police were coming and wanted them to see he wasn't holding a gun. He took the catcher and the rye out of his pocket and tried to read it as he paced the sidewalk and waited. A police car roared up to the Dakota and two uniformed police jumped out. One ran inside. A witness to the shooting pointed out Chapman to the other police officer. Chapman put his hands in the air. Don't hurt me, he pleaded. I'm unarmed. I acted alone, he said as the officer spread eagled him against the wall and searched him. The police cuffed him and put him in the back seat of their car. I'm sorry I gave you guys all this trouble, he kept telling them. End quote. A police officer bent over Lennon and asked, Do you know who you are? By then, John was unable to answer. John Lennon was rushed in a police cruiser to the emergency room of the Roosevelt Hospital, where he was pronounced dead on arrival at 11.15 p.m. Eastern Time. Just an aside, I remember this night well. I was unable to sleep that night for one reason or another. Often, it was nightmares that kept me awake. This happened to be one of those nights. As our local station went off the air at midnight, I'd scroll through the AM band of my little purple single-speaker realistic transistor radio, and if the atmosphere was just right, I could often hear radio stations in New York City, which were on the air all night. That night, I heard about John Lennon's murder as it hit the airwaves. I recall the sadness in the voices of the DJs who were playing Beatles songs continuously, All You Need Is Love and A Day in the Life or A Couple, I'd always been a Beatles fan, and though I was only 11, I appreciated their message. I've spent many years since learning as much as I could about the band and John Lennon in particular, and it's a point in my life that I doubt I'll ever forget. And this away game has been in the works as long as Dark Poutine has been around. Yoko Ono issued a statement the following day saying, There is no funeral for John, ending it with the words, John loved and prayed for the human race. Please do the same for him, end quote. His remains were cremated at the Ferncliff Cemetery in Hartsdale, New York. Yoko scattered his ashes in New York's Central Park, where the Strawberry Fields Memorial was later created. Chapman avoided going to trial when he ignored his lawyer's advice and pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced to 20 years to life. I remember well the candlelight vigils held all over, in particular scenes from the one in New York as fans outside the Dakota sang John's songs and sobbed. Annie Leibowitz had taken a now extremely well-known photo of John and Yoko lying on their bed together on the day of John's murder. 
In it, John Lennon, naked and lying on his side, is embracing the fully clad Yoko, who is laying on her back, hands above her head. It's said that Yoko places a lit candle in the window of Lennon's room in the Dakota every year on 8th of December, and other tributes to the beloved Beatle are still held all over. There were many tribute songs written by John's friends and contemporaries. Elton John, a pal of Lennon's, and songwriter Bernie Taupin wrote the tribute Empty Garden, Hey Hey Johnny, one of my favorites. John's death even brought the remaining Beatles back together for George Harrison's 1981 tune, All Those Years Ago. George's lyrics tell a tale of mourning a friend. Quote, Living with good and bad, I always looked up to you. Now we're left cold and sad by someone, the devil's best friend, someone who offended all. End quote. Chapman said of his desire to kill Lennon, quote, It was just a tremendous compulsion of just feeling this big hole, of being what I thought was a big nobody, a big nothing, I couldn't let it go, and it just kept going very strongly, and I couldn't stop it, end quote. When asked whether he was an average ordinary kid, he responded, normal kids don't grow up to shoot ex-Beatles. Many believe that Mark David Chapman was a nobody who murdered John Lennon to become a somebody, but it didn't quite work out that way. In a 2004 parole hearing, Chapman said that the reverse had occurred, quote, I'm a bigger nobody than I was before, end quote. This reminds me, ironically, of the Beatles tune Nowhere Man. It opens with the lyrics, He's a real nowhere man, sitting in his nowhere land, making all his nowhere plans for nobody. Now residing in his Green Haven, New York prison today, Mark David Chapman is still a nobody. Well, he's a somebody in the eyes of the prison system. He is prisoner number 81A3860. He's been in jail since his arrest, and his next parole hearing is slated for February 2024. Thanks to the continued negative public sentiment about the killer for slaying such a beloved figure, it's likely he'll never be released. The parole board has repeatedly said that it has not released him because of the extreme malicious intent he had shown in John's murder. I want to finish with something John Lennon said once. He said, quote, Peace is not something you wish for, it's something you make, something you do, something you are, and something you give away. End quote. Let's be peaceful and be human, warts and all just like John. My question to you, Matthew, as we finish this episode, do you think Mark David Chapman should ever get out of jail? No. No? If you buy a ticket to commit murder, that's that's like hyper premeditated. Like a plane ticket? Right. It's yeah. hyper premeditated. Yeah. The, the guy does not deserve to get out. No. I, I, I think, you know, he was maybe conflicted about it in a weird way because he gets an autograph signed and is unable to shoot him. The first time he meets John Lennon, which is kind of weird. Didn't you find that a strange thing? Yeah, I, I saw it as sort of, okay, well, wasn't ready, needed to keep working himself up for it, right? Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Yep. Oh, oh, no doubt. And that is it for Dark Poutine episode 248, Away Game, The Murder of John Lennon. That's right. It's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at 1 877 327 5786 or 1 877 D A R K P T N. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. Okay, it is time for voicemails, and uh, we have a few this week. Thankfully, some people took a time out of their busy schedules to give us a phone call. Uh, I think we've got three pretty great voicemails. I really don't know because we haven't listened to them yet. So let's have a listen. Uh, we do these sort of like on the fly. So if it's terrible, we just go to the next. Hey, Mike Matthews and adorable for rabies. I just left like, the longest message and got cut off. So we keep this really short. I just had to do a whirlwind trip. Sorry, this is River, your pal River from uh, BC, long time listener, second time caller. Um, just had to do a whirlwind trip for the first time by myself from BC to Saskatchewan. Thank you for keeping me company. Also, just kind of wanted to share with other listeners who might be more vulnerable, like me, because of who we are based on the facts of how we turned out to be, <laughs> uh, who are more vulnerable and at risk when traveling alone. Just wanted to share some tips um, that thankfully you and my other favorite podcast, and that's why we drink have been probably inspired me to do is to uh, just like pay for everything with debit and credit, uh, keep your gas tank above a quarter of a tank, keep your phone charged at all times, 
and share your route with your loved ones. Um, I just traveled like 2000 kilometers by myself through some pretty like rural areas and I felt safer because of it. And no matter how prepared you are, doesn't mean something terrible can happen. Give yourself a fighting chance. Anyway, thank you so much, uh, both of you, for the good you put out in the world. And uh, go shoot in your hat. Take care. Bye. Well, thank you very much. And good tips. Those are really good tips for travel, actually. You know, that's, that's very timely. Um, Create I, a paper trail. Yeah. Make sure that you have enough gas. Like, all of that. Yeah. I, I'm thinking about driving with Justin and Steve to Las Vegas in the spring. <sighs> I am thinking about flying to Las Vegas in the spring. And I was trying to figure out routes. Yep. And one of them goes through um, Utah. Okay. And I'm like, is it safe for us in Utah? Hmm. Right? And, and it's, That's a good question. And it's funny, like you actually, as, as a gay couple, like yeah, you have obviously to. a gay couple, mm -hmm. right? It's sort of like where, like what route up should I take? And I don't think I'm being overly paranoid, but there's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now. I actually stopped and thought like, hey, what's a safer route for us? Yeah. Right. So yeah. like River, thanks. That's really, I, actually the, some of those tips are really super useful. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, it's sad that people have to think that way, but you know, good that they do, you know? Yeah. We are, we're invited to stay at a place in, in the spring and I realized I didn't want to leave Steve alone, so we're going to drive down with the dog. <laughs> oh, that's fun. Yeah. Let's listen to another voicemail. Oh, we have another one here. Let's, oh, I wonder what this one's about. Interesting. Hey there, Mike and Matthew. Cindy from Lansing here. Long-time listener, first-time caller, and embarrassing late to the party and catching up with your book, Mike. I'm fix um, fixing that today by uh, chewing it up as I get ready to run the five-miler in this morning's turkey trot in Cleveland. It's an American Thanksgiving today, and I have a lot to be thankful for. So before I go, I wanted to also mention that I'm finishing up travel plans to be in your neck of the woods in, in May for the Vancouver Marathon weekend. I'm not running the full marathon. I'm only running the half, but that's plenty enough for me. So keep up the good work and go shit in your hat. Bye-bye. Well, there you go. It gives us an incentive in May to maybe have a meetup. We need to have a Vancouver meetup or three. Like, really. That'd be fun. So she's from Lansing. Lansing. Always reminds me, whenever I got on the train, Yeah. The, uh, in French, I always remembered it, uh, uh, that we would go to East Lansing, Kalamazoo, e Chicago. <laughs> so that was that was like the Via Rail in French. And, oh, there and, you and go. And I always knew that uh, Kalamazoo was after East Lansing. East Lansing. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of fun. But uh, I hope you did well at your turkey trot. And good on you for getting some exercise. That's probably something I should do more of. That's, that's very um, running during the festive ED season. Yeah. <laughs> it's sort of like the opposite of what I do. <laughs> yeah. Right. Thanks for calling. Thank you. Um, this next one is a little mysterious. I, we did have a sort of a really brief listen to it uh, because it's very short. It's, so Maybe somebody can translate Somebody should be able to translate for us. I think we can probably translate a little bit ourselves because I have a sneaking suspicion something isn't right. Anyway, let's have a listen. <laughs> So she said something about FedEx at the beginning. So I think what it is, really? it, I think it's a Fed, one of those scam calls. Okay. But maybe there's an actual FedEx package that's waiting for us that has like a million dollars in, in bearer bonds. Or maybe we just have a fan from Hong Kong that called in. Could be and wanted to send us something via FedEx. Cool. Uh, I really don't <laughs> think that that's the case. <laughs> So if one of our Chinese listeners who speaks the language, I'm not sure if it was Mandarin or Cantonese, who speaks the language uh, could translate for us, that would be fantastic. That would be useful. I would appreciate that. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> what a weird voicemail. Okay, bye-bye voicemail, bye-bye. That's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one 327 5786 or... 1877-DARKPTN. We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. 
If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. So we don't have any new Donut Money donors or patrons, but that's fine. Oh, we'll get some in the future. Maybe. Oh, I'm sure we will. <laughs> Maybe. It, it is that time of year and people are, uh, you know, that's all you hear about in the news is how t times are tough for folks. I mean, so I bought you a Christmas gift. Yeah. And then I ate it all yesterday. <laughs> What? I bought you a tin of biscuit shortbread. Oh. And like sat down in the morning and ate the entire thing by myself in about 2.5 seconds. So do you want the empty tin? It has a little plaid um, Loch Ness monster on it. It's really cute. I'd love the tin. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would have loved the shortbread cookies too. <laughs> but uh, they were really good, Mike. Well, uh, well thanks, Matthew. <laughs> Well, thank you for the gift. You're so thoughtful. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, this is the story of my life. Somebody else has eaten my cookies. <laughs> oh, no. I used to think that when I was drinking that somebody was drinking my beer. But uh, no, it was me. Yeah, it was you <laughs> drinking your beer. Yeah. Oh, well. But uh, but yeah, I know it's it, I know times are tough. It's, it is what it is. It's all good. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to all our patrons and Donut Money donors, past and present, for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash darkpoutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening. And tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. And that's it for Dark Poutine uh, for this week anyway. And we will be back next week with our annual Christmas episode. Jingle, oh my, jingle, jingle, jingle. Yeah, jingly jingles. And uh, yeah, like we usually do, it may or may not be something that is may or, that may, or may not be. Don't give it away. Don't give it away. Okay. Anyway. So yeah, it's, uh, it's fun. Let's just say our next episode is a little fun. Don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. To the core. To the core. Bye, everybody.